My name is Rachel Havacost. I am a writer and mental health advocate. I was diagnosed with an eating disorder when I was 15. About 10 years after getting diagnosed, I went to treatment and it was the first time I'd ever been in group therapy. After that, there was a big turning point for me around finding ways to connect through lived experience and that being a window into saying, okay, now I'm willing and ready to engage in some tools or trying different things or maybe challenging some of the thought patterns I have from just like being a human being and navigating life and sort of the unnamed things that a lot of people don't talk about for fear of being labeled a certain way, all the way up to full-blown pathology and, and mental health diagnoses and navigating just the full spectrum of it. Both my parents were married when I was, at the time, while I was uh, growing up, and I had a younger brother. I was in a middle-class home. I had a very stable childhood. There were things that were happening in my in my childhood that from the outside looking in or from as just being a kiddo, like experiencing them, led me to believe that there was anything wrong with the way I was being raised or wrong with the way life was going and it wasn't until much later in life that I was in therapy and I looked back that I was able to, to sort of see oh these were some things that were happening in my childhood that were not so healthy and were not so as I in my mind thought like a perfect childhood so my dad was growing up which I wasn't aware of as a kid in my mind there was one version of and it was violent it was volatile it was abusive and that was the only image I had of in my in my mind so even when when my mom had told me and my brother growing up you know your dad's and I've asked him to go to AA. We were like, what is, what are you talking about? Like, no, he's not. He just likes to enjoy beer when he gets home from work. And like, he's just silly at parties. In retrospect, I, I now recognize that a lot of the behaviors and a lot of the absence that my dad exhibited both emotionally and physically for, for me and with my mom were sort of drawn in with his so I grew up with a very absent father in terms of his emotional availability. But for me, that was normal, right? So I didn't know I didn't know that that, that was impacting me until later on as an, as an adult woman. And I, I now recognize the ways that that has impacted me. My household was very much, it was about how, how well everyone was performing. So I'd get home from school and the questions at the dinner table, table were, how are your grades? How did you do in your piano recital? There was very little conversation around how are you feeling? What are the thoughts you're having? How are your relationships? There was a lot of emphasis on accolades. My dad was the primary bread maker. He, he worked a nine to five job and he would come home at night, have dinner with us, crack open a beer and then usually be on the couch drinking until bedtime. And I didn't have a, a very close relationship with him. I mean, he was always very kind and loving to me and I, I knew that he loved me, but he didn't often tell me like, I'm proud of you or I think you're doing really wonderful in life or I want to hear about what's going on in your world. Like, let's have a conversation. I also didn't really know how to please him and I was constantly kind of trying to figure out how can I make my dad happy because he's not telling me if he's pleased with me or not. And then my mom was very, very anxious. My mom was a really anxious person. I remember oftentimes observing her being very fixated on her body and food. She was a big runner. She would like to eat very healthy. We weren't allowed to have a lot of certain foods in the house. And I remember thinking like, this is something that I have to be really mindful of. Like I have to be really, I have to pay attention to, to my body and I have to pay attention to food. My mom also really struggled to communicate with me. She was always really worried. Like I just remember my mom being worried all the time about where I was, about what I was doing. She wanted to know everything. So she wanted to know who I was with, where I was going. I remember also at one point she was upset with me about something but rather than talking to me about it directly she left a note by my bed she really struggled to have like direct conversations with me so here's my dad who like didn't talk to me about anything and then here's my mom who wanted to talk to me but didn't know how to and so she would leave me notes i remember growing up feeling very much like my job is to make sure that i'm performing at my highest because that's how my parents will be happy and i need to make sure that i get good grades so i go to a good school so my parents are proud of me and i can't get into trouble because if i get into trouble then my mom's sad. I remember oftentimes like if I was upset about something then she was upset, I was upset, and then all of a sudden I was taking care of her. <laughs> and so I remember oftentimes also feeling like I wasn't allowed to have feelings because if I did I was going to be hurting other people with my emotions. So I learned to kind of just internalize everything and take care of everything by myself. When I started to like go to high school and started to experience a lot more stress both in school and socially and relationally and I started dating. All these things that I probably needed an adult figure to help me navigate, I didn't I didn't ask them for help because I didn't think I could. I thought I, I had to figure it all out by myself. I remember going on a date with this guy who I had a huge crush on and there had already been conversation in my high school between boys and girls about which girl in the class had the best body, who had the best butt, who had the best abs. And I had already started to kind of equate my value as a 
woman to my body and the way it looked, especially in the eyes of men. I remember going on this date with this guy that I had a crush on who at one point in the, in the year prior had made a comment about how I was gonna be hot once I lost my baby fat. So I'm going on a date with this guy and, and I remember we drove from Seattle to Vancouver together. So we were in a car together for three hours and I remember thinking, don't eat too much, Rachel. You don't wanna look fat while you're there. And I know when I, when I eat, my stomach gets a little fuller, so don't eat anything in the car. And we get up to Vancouver and we start walking through this little town. And I remember having this thought of like, oh, oh gosh, like I, I must not be interesting enough for him. And on top of that, if I'm not beautiful enough, then I have nothing to offer him. At the end of the date, he said like, well, we might as well just go home now. And I remember think, I remember thinking like, wow, okay, well, I'm definitely not interesting enough and I'm clearly not beautiful enough. So this is never gonna go anywhere. And there was no direct correlation of like, okay, now I need to stop eating. But the, the next week I stopped eating. The next week I went online and I looked for ways to lose weight really quickly and I found pro-anorexia websites that talked a lot about how to restrict your calories and how fast people were losing weight and I decided I'm gonna just, I'm gonna get skinny. That's what I'm gonna do. And as soon as that cycle began, it just developed really, really quickly. It, tur it turned into something that I no longer felt like I could live without because it gave me such a sense of power and a sense of control in a way where I felt like I had discovered some superpower to make life feel better and feel easier. I decided I was gonna start heavily reducing my meals. And I think I started with by cutting my breakfast down to like eating only half a grapefruit. And then pretty quickly I just decided I'm just not gonna eat any meals unless I have to. My mom would be getting ready upstairs and I'd run down to the kitchen, make a bunch of sounds like I was pouring cereal and make a bowl with like a little bit of milk and like crumbs and put it by the, the sink to make it look like I had eaten breakfast and then I'd run upstairs and get ready. At lunchtime, I would hide. So I would hide in the bathroom or I would pretend to be asleep on the couch in the common area. And then at dinner time, when I was with my family, because my family always ate dinner together, I would eat dinner, but I would eat as little as possible. And that would be the only meal I would eat all day long. So it became kind of a ritual of in the, in the mornings of sneak into the bathroom to weigh myself, sneak downstairs to fake a breakfast, and then in the afternoons, sneak away during lunch to make sure no one knew I was eating. My mom noticed that my weight had changed drastically and so she took me to see a children's doctor who diagnosed me with an eating disorder and said, you know, you need to take your daughter to a therapist, a nutritionist, and the specialist doctor at the children's hospital. And I remember we left the doctor's office and the first thought I had was, if I have to gain weight, I'm gonna have fun doing it. And immediately a binge cycle began from that. I remember we left the doctor's office and we had just gone to the grocery store. So my mom had a bunch of groceries in the trunk and we left and I had that thought of, if I have to gain weight, I'm gonna have fun doing it. And I opened the trunk and I grabbed a bag of popcorn and I went to the front seat and I opened up the bag and I just started eating it. And the first thing my mom said was, slow down, you don't have to eat the whole bag. And I thought to myself, like, I can't win. Like, <laughs> I can't win like I either am not eating enough or I'm eating too much and it either way in your eyes it's not good enough and I just in that moment I felt paralyzed I felt paralyzed by her criticism and by her inability to recognize what was going on but I also felt paralyzed by my own thoughts and what I wanted and what the doctors wanted and I just felt like I can't do anything right. And from that moment on, I entered into a binge restrict cycle that lasted another 10 years. After about four or five years of being in this binge restrict cycle of my eating disorder, I started to experience depression for the first time. I didn't really understand where the depression was coming from. And so I also felt a lot of shame because I didn't think I had anything to be depressed about because there didn't seem to be anything wrong in my life. My depression worsened once I went off to college. So I, left home and I went to go study in New York. I really struggled to make friends. I really struggled to get outside my comfort zone. I was so wrapped up in my eating disorder and this idea that if I looked a certain way, then people would want to be my friend. And the more I fixated on that, the less I socialized and the more depressed I became. I started to actually drink a lot of um, in ways that were not productive. So outside of like partying with my friends, I was drinking during the day, I was drinking during class. About a year after college started, my depression was so bad that I was skipping classes and I wasn't able to really get up in the morning, wasn't able to go to most of my, my classes or finish my classwork. And a, a dear friend of mine was, was killed in a boating accident the summer between my freshman and sophomore year. 
and that shifted my depression into such a bad state that I started having suicidal thoughts. I didn't know how to deal with the news. I didn't know how to deal with the grief. And in the same way, I didn't know how to reach out to my parents when I was struggling as a teenager. I didn't know how to reach out to somebody when this happened. And so I didn't talk to anyone. I didn't call my parents. I didn't talk to my friends. I think I mentioned to them, hey, Lyle just died. And they were like, we're, you know, we're really sorry. How can we support you? And I, I didn't know, I didn't know. How to, how to say this is what I need because they didn't know what it was like to get support or ask for support when life happens. And so again, I like really turned inward and tried to cope by myself and I didn't know how to. So I started drinking a lot more, I started binge eating a lot more. I couldn't tolerate the pain of him being gone. I couldn't tolerate the anger I felt towards myself for not telling him more that I cared about him, for not telling him that I loved him. I couldn't tolerate the idea of him not existing, of not ever getting to see him again. I did everything I could to not feel any of those things and my depression got incredibly bad. My eating disorder got incredibly bad. And I started to wrap this story around in my head that it was me that should have died and not him because he was so good and his life had so much promise. It wasn't fair that he died and that I was still alive. I also wrapped myself around this story that if only I had told him I loved him, that maybe that could have been one domino that would have just tipped the scales and maybe altered the entire course of his life and he would still be here. Once I started having suicidal thoughts, I started self-harming. It was so odd because I remember thinking, how did I become this person that hates myself? I'd already experienced a lot of self-hatred, so that wasn't new, but that paired with the desire to inflict pain upon myself was sort of, if I felt very dissociative for a really long time, I felt like I wasn't really living in my own body. And, and in a lot of ways too, I felt like I deserved to feel more pain than I was feeling. So self-harm became a way for me to suffer more and feel pain when I couldn't feel sadness. So in any moment where I wasn't feeling sad about Lyle being gone, I wanted to hurt myself so that I could feel feel pain. Because if I wasn't in pain, then I wasn't, then I, then I must not have cared enough. I don't remember the, the first time it happened, but I do remember that I had bobby pin and I would use that to just scratch on my forearms and until I would bleed. And I was too scared to use a knife. I was too scared to like really cut my skin, but I did want to see blood and I did want to make a scratch mark because I wanted it to be visible. I remember feeling like I want people to see that I'm in pain. I remember sitting in my bathroom in the dorm room crying, using these bobby pins to just scratch at my arm, at my chest, and my thighs. And there was some sense of relief as soon as I would draw blood. And at the same time, I felt, I just felt so, like I'm this person now that this is the only way I can go. I can only go darker, I can only go worse. And the, the worse it gets, the less understood I am. And the less understood I am, the, the more alone I am. And so I started to just think, this is the only direction that things can go. I'm beyond help now, I'm beyond help. Like I'm now somebody that like, I'm now someone that drinks during the day and can't go to class anymore and sits in my dorm room bathroom with a bobby pin until I bleed. Like, I'm beyond, I'm beyond help. And so I just started to think like, it would probably be easier for everyone if I was just gone. And in a lot of ways I thought like, I thought it would be easier for me if I was gone because I was in so much pain. And I didn't have any plan. Like I didn't think like, okay, on this day, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. But I had kind of constant thoughts of, everyone else would be better off if I wasn't here. And maybe if I, and maybe I would finally feel some relief from, from all this pain. One night I was sitting in my dorm room. I had, I had started doing this thing where I would watch old videos of Lyle because he was a singer. I would watch old videos of him singing. And so I was sitting in my dorm room watching videos of him singing, drinking and crying and writing letters to him, apologizing for for my neglect, apologizing for not telling him I loved him. And then writing, I'm writing letters to myself about how much I hated myself. I don't know what shifted in my head. I don't know if I said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kill myself. But I went into my bathroom and I just, I swallowed all of, I had like a bottle of like, but I swallowed all the pills and I sat in the bathroom. I don't remember what happened next. I remember waking up in the hospital and then later on my friends kind of telling me what had happened. But I remember waking up in the hospital with my friends by my bed and a, a nurse asking me some questions and I was yelling at her. I was yelling at her. She was asking me about, have you ever had, had experiences with mental illness? And I remember shouting at her like, yeah, I just tried to kill myself.
Um, and I and I don't normally yell at people, and I remember yelling at her and being so mad because I just I don't I don't I just thought, how can you not sense that something is wrong if I'm laying here in this hospital bed? And then I don't remember anything after that. I remember waking up again, and I was sitting in a a wheelchair, like in a hospital gown, in a very bright hallway, and I was in a psych ward in New York City. That that was definitely a, a rock bottom moment, and from that moment. For years and years to come, things only got better. I remember, I remember being in that hospital and thinking, I don't, I don't ever want to be, I don't ever want to be here again. I will do everything I can to make sure that this never happens again because this is not me. This is not who I am. I'm not someone that is in a psych ward. It wasn't because I had judgments towards the people that were there. It was more of like, I know that, I know that my life is supposed to be better than this. So after I went to the psych ward, my mom came to visit me. And I remember we went for a walk in Central Park. At one point she turned to me and she said, you know, Rachel, if you need to come home and take a break from school, your father and I would be okay with that. And I remember feeling this huge sense of relief because it felt like the first time my mom had given me permission to rest. And it felt like the first time I was given the opportunity to not put my performance and my success at the forefront of my life, but I could put my life at the forefront. <laughs> And so I did, I took a leave of absence, I went home and I got a job, I started working, I focused on how can I, how can I have a better relationship with food in my body, how can I start to maybe rekindle some friendships from back home, and just being somewhere familiar, being in a stable place, being near family helped me to find some stability, to get back on my feet and get to a place where I wasn't experiencing symptoms of my major depression. I was still experiencing some anxiety and stress, but not to the point of feeling completely overwhelmed and panicked by life. And so over the, over the course of the next year, I started to, I started to stabilize. I decided to go on a big trip with my cousin. So I started saving up some money. We were gonna go backpacking through Asia. And while I was saving money, I, I got a second job working at a gym and I met my now ex-husband, Josh. So he was also working at the front desk and we fell in love. He encouraged me to go back to school. So I, I, I went back to school and I finished my degree in Washington State. I started to teach theater at, at a middle school and fell in love with teaching and the theater world again. And Josh and I were building this wonderful life together. We moved in together. We had a really beautiful relationship. I loved his friends, his friends loved my friends got along with each other's family. My life felt like it was expanding in really joyful ways. I think for probably about five years or so, life felt really, really wonderful. So after some time of stability and teaching theater for several years, I thought, okay, I think I'm ready to go back out there and start acting again. And as soon as I started acting again and being in, in a highly stressful environment of being being rejected, of having to look a certain way, a lot of my symptoms started to resurface and I relapsed in my eating disorder in a pretty bad way. And so Josh sat me down one night and said, you know, Rachel, I think you're struggling with your eating disorder and I want you to get help. So I decided to go to treatment and went to uh, intensive outpatient treatment for about four months. It, that totally changed my life. And it also changed my relationship with Josh quite a bit because it was the first time that I was learning a lot about my childhood and my past and experiences I'd had before meeting Josh that were contributing to not just my eating disorder, but the ways that I interacted with other people in my life. So I was learning to set boundaries for the first time. I was learning to ask for what I need. I was learning to say no. I was learning all of the ways that many sexual experiences I had had prior to Josh were actually non-consensual um, assault scenarios that impacted the way I understood what it's supposed to look like to have meaningful, healthy sex. I thought that the only point of sex was for the man to have a good time and my job was to be a body and show up and do a performance. Unlearning a lot of that in therapy also meant relearning how to engage with my partner in sexual scenarios that he had been used to for a really long time. And not that he was ever in any way harmful or abusive, like he was an incredibly wonderful human being. He just knew me a certain way intimately. It was just how I thought I was supposed to be. And so unlearning that and then rediscovering who we were as a couple really was was challenging after I went to therapy because I was basically unlearning how to be as a human being and then relearning it for the first time. And so our relationship started to shift once I went, went to treatment. And so we did the best that we could to manage you know, all the things I was learning to integrate them into our relationship and to support me as I went off to grad school. So there were all these changes kind of happening. And once we moved so that I could go to school, he had proposed. So we were planning a wedding. 
I was in grad school, still trying to figure out who I was after all this therapy and all this work. And our relationship, while seemingly was doing well, I think underneath the surface was starting to crumble. So I'm 35 years old. I turned 35 this December and I am living back in Seattle, which is the city I grew up in. I'm single. I have an adorable little mini golden noodle. I'm writing. I'm traveling. I have a good set of friends. I'm incredibly close with my parents and my brother. Life still happens. Shit still doesn't go well. I still get anxious and insecure. I think the only other thing I would want to say is that it does get better. And I know that sometimes it doesn't feel like it will. And it feels like it's impossible. And it feels like the pain is relentless. And it does get better. And it is so worth it. And I also just want to remind folks that like, if today feels like the hardest day in the world, You've gotten through 100% of your hardest days. You have a 100% success rate and you can get through this one too.